Good afternoon and welcome to the Aspen Institute. On behalf of the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group and the Rural Development Innovation Group, I want to thank you for joining us today for this, which is the sixth in our lunchtime series called America's Rural Opportunity. I am Janet Topolsky. I'm an executive director of the Community Strategies Group here at the Aspen Institute. What Aspen CSG does and our focus is to really connect, motivate, and equip leaders at the local level to both build more prosperous economies and advance people living on the economic margins as they do that. Aspen CSG partners, as I mentioned, with the Rural Development Innovation Group to put on this series and to organize it. Now, what is the Rural Development Innovation Group? That is a group of 15 seasoned practitioners, rural development practitioners, and funders and intermediaries from across the country, each of whom are deeply or is deeply engaged in rural economic development uh, across the United States. We began meeting earlier in 2016, and the aim of the Rural Development Innovation Group is really threefold. It's to lift up a rural opportunity agenda by surfacing and sharing innovative approaches to strengthen rural economies, families, and communities. The RDIG is actually quite concerned that there's been a lot of focus on urban innovation in the last five to ten years, but not as much focus on some of the really robust and interesting rural innovation going on in the country. Secondly, the RDIG wants to increase understanding about what is working and why it's working so we can accelerate and spread creative and proven approaches to more rural places. And thirdly, what the Arctic <coughs> really wants to do is help public, uh, the public sector and philanthropic organizations understand better how they can more effectively invest in rural America so more of this innovation can happen. Today's session is going to focus on getting ahead in rural jobs. We chose to come at this topic in three ways, and they might be a little surprising. You know, it's not all about traditional workforce development we're talking about here. We want to talk about three things. You have to get the job to begin with, right? First, we want to highlight what it takes to get rural adults to access and complete education that's going to qualify them for better jobs in their regions. Focusing, in this case, on the story from an innovative rural community college in Odessa, Texas. Secondly, you have to be able to accept the job. Let's say you get the job, you've got to be able to accept it. And what that means is we're going to focus today on one of the quiet crises that's in rural America that has become an economic development issue. It's a quiet crisis that's getting a lot louder. And that is the availability of child care for parents who want to work but can't because the quality of the child care or the availability of it in terms of hours and even the the quality of child care jobs themselves is lacking in rural America. And thirdly, you, you let's say you get the job, you accept the job, you've got to be able to stay on the job. And so we want to feature an innovative collaboration of employers from Mason County, Michigan, of small to mid-sized companies that have banded together to help their current employees improve their personal and financial situations and find resources so they can improve their family stability and potentially move up the <coughs> career ladder over time. So I should have mentioned on being able to accept the job, we have a great story from Western North Carolina. I didn't, I didn't mention Western North Carolina. I can't miss that. They'd be after me, Western North Carolina, all of them. So, and then we're also pleased to have with us today Beth Mattingly, who is with uh, the Carsey School at the University of New Hampshire. And before each of these stories, she's going to highlight some data from rural America and, in some cases, urban America that sets the context for each story. So before we start, we do want to acknowledge and thank the organizations that have provided support for this series throughout 2017. Besides our own organization, the Aspen Institute Community Strategies Group, those include the Northern Forest Center, the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, Encourage Community Foundation, Lore Foundation, the Northwest Area Foundation, Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, and specifically for this particular session, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, which has offered primary support for uh, uh, for us for a long time, building on examining the to, to examine the factors that help or hinder rural families from achieving economic success. So, if you want to share your thoughts during today's discussion or on today's di discussion, please use hashtag Rural Innovation, which I think is right up there on the screen if you can see it. And if you can't see it, I'll say it again: hashtag Rural Innovation. 
To learn more, get updates, or share your stories of rural innovation, visit us at as.pn slash rural, or follow us on Twitter at Rural Innovators. So let's get started. The way our session is going to run today is our moderator is going to queue up the relevant data for each story, and then each story in turn, and then ask the group some of her probing questions. Then we'll have time at the end for some questions and comments from people here in the room and from the you know hundreds and hundreds of people in the live stream audience, and we know some of those are watching parties, so we're looking for questions from the watching parties. So please start sharing your questions using hashtag rural innovation whenever you have them. Travis is here, we'll, he'll be collecting them, and we'll, we'll get to some of those questions later, question early and often. So now let me introduce Danielle Paquette, who will be moderating and probing today's panel. Danielle is originally from Indianapolis, and she previously worked for the Tampa Bay Times with short stints at the LA Times and CNN as well. She is now a reporter for the Washington Post covering the intersection of people and policy, and that means she has wide range. So we thought she would be game to come home to the range of rural people and rural policy. Danielle, I turn the conversation over to you. Wow, Janet, thank you for that wonderful introduction and, and welcome everyone today. Um, I cover the issues we speak about quite often and I'm just so glad to be joined by such experts. Uh, joining us today we have Greg Williams, he's the president of Odessa College in West Texas. Uh, Sheila Hoyle, she's the executive director of the Southwestern Child Development Commission. And Lynn Russell, she's the executive director of United Way of Mason County in Michigan. Uh, and with that, I will turn to Beth for some data on childcare. Thank you. I'm going to um, highlight a few key takeaway statistics, a few, a few key points for each relevant to each domain. But in the folders that I gave you, we, that are on your chair, there is a lot more data, a lot more information, a lot more backup. And so, if you have questions now or questions later, I encourage you to be in contact. So first I want to talk a little bit about disconnected youth. And if you look here, those blue bars represent urban America and the green bars are rural America. And by disconnected, I mean not attending school and not working. And this is a pretty young group, 18 to 24 year olds. And certainly there's a small share of them who may be doing other productive things that aren't reflected in the data. Maybe some are young moms taking care of young kids. Maybe some are taking a year to do some travel before going to college. But by and large, this tends to be a group that I'm concerned about, a lot of people are concerned about, because they're not starting that transition to adulthood and starting on a path that's going to further their career trajectory and enable them to establish themselves in the workforce, develop self-sufficiency, and so forth. And you know, I highlight throughout many of my slides differences between the native-born and foreign-born populations because I do have an interest in understanding some of those differences. But in this slide, there's not a huge difference. You know, but more than one in five of these young folks across rural America it falls into this category. So I just want to highlight that and highlight too that it's a bit larger um, than in urban America. Um, when we think about getting workforce ready, we think about education. And we're talking a lot today about um, different training programs, different things we can do. And I highlight here the difference in earnings for those who have just a high school degree versus simply a two-year degree. Of course, we hear a lot about the importance of a bachelor's degree and advanced degrees for really getting ahead in today's society and, and in our current economy. But I want to point out about, for, 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 for non-immigrants, about a $14,000 increase in, in salary annually for those with only um, mm. a high school degree compared to an associate's. And of course, this compounds over time. So when you, when you think about this over the life course, there, there's a lot going on. Um, I also want to talk just to show ed educational attainment and obviously the foreign born are generally less educated than the native born and rural Americans tend to have lower educational attainment than urban and I want to highlight that two thirds, more than two thirds of rural Americans have only a high school degree or less, I'm sorry, an associate's degree or less education. And finally, just to highlight, counties with higher median income have higher educational attainment. This isn't surprising. This is limited to rural America. And I just want to highlight quickly that 
The richer counties have people who are more highly educated. This should be pretty intuitive, but this is just a graphical representation of that. And I said finally, but I forgot there was this one last slide on industry. And the big thing to note here is the rise in service occupations between 1960 and 2015 and the decline in agriculture. Now you'll notice in 2015 that manufacturing doesn't show up and had we aggregated all manufacturing industries it certainly would appear but we did limit that we did this by each specific industry so no one of the 80 or so manufacturing industries appears on the chart. Thank you Beth. Uh, with that let's turn it to Greg. Uh, you down in Texas you're you're on the ground you're helping these young people reach higher and higher levels of education. Why does that matter and how are you doing that? Danielle, thank you. And uh, I'd like to say hello to the audience today and, and uh, thank you all for giving uh, some of your time and, and your lunch time to come and, and spend some moments with us. I will remind you that I, that I am a college president, so it's going to be tough for me to stay in this seat. Uh, I would rather walk around the room and, and nice talk and touch bases with each of you and then maybe ask you for a gift at the end of that, uh, <laughs> that moment. But um, not an offering, but a gift. So uh, slightly different in that regard. But I, I do thank you all for being here, and uh, we appreciate your, your time and attention. Uh, we're going to talk about community colleges. We're going to talk about uh, some of the things we're doing uh, in Odessa. Uh, keep in mind that community colleges are one of the ways out of uh, poverty, of, uh, of having uh, limited choices, one of the ways into the American dream. So keep that in mind. And I, and I also believe that we're very underutilized. I think that uh, we, we need programs like this and discussions like this so more people can realize that your community college can be a tremendous resource. Also keep in mind that um, when we're talking about community college students, they are some of the brightest people you've ever met. Uh, they can be, uh, they can accomplish tremendous things. Many of the people that you know who've gone on to do wonderful things have community college experiences in their background. The challenge that we talk about is not one of intelligence. That's one of those I words that we've all heard about. It's not one of intelligence, but it's more <coughs> one of interest. It's one of interest. If we can get their interest, then the students who choose to come our direction, and we need more of them to choose that direction, they can do very well, not only in college, but they can transfer to universities, and that's an important part of our work. Uh, but they can do very well in life as well. I hail from uh, Odessa, Texas, which is in West Texas, and uh, we are known uh, for, lately, we're known for Friday Night Lights. I know you all have heard about that in Permian football, and you know, that's all we do is football. We work and go and watch football games. <laughs> Yeah, that's a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> Some of you were so believing that. <laughs> no, we, we, we do a lot of other stuff, but uh, we but the Friday Night Lights put us on the map again nationally. George Bush, his home was in Midland, Texas, which is our, our close neighbor, and, and uh, we're about uh, two hours away from Texas Tech University, just to give you an idea of uh, who we are. Our population in our county is about 130,000 people uh, that we serve. We are uh, on the, the western part of the state uh, near New Mexico actually, so that again you can have that context. Our students, the, the, um, our students much of the time in their estimations they do not need college because they can make a great living when all is doing what it does best and selling at really high levels uh, for high uh, dollar amounts per barrel, uh, people can do really well. A CDL truck driver, a person with a CDL license can make between starting uh, and can start and make between seventy and eighty thousand dollars per year. So that gives you a, a little bit of context. Uh, about that, but when the price of oil goes down, uh, those opportunities tend to go down and uh, students don't have quite the flexibility that they one had, once had. Uh, we're, we're appreciative of the Aspen, the Aspen Institute for hosting this meeting today and we at Odessa College are appreciative of uh, Aspen uh, and the Aspen Prize for honoring us uh, earlier this year. Uh, with dollars and being one of the winners and being seen as a rising star uh, in these United States. 
uh, of the 1,100 community colleges, we were one of five who were able to receive funding uh, from Aspen. So we're very appreciative of that, and we, we thank them for their work. When a student completes our programs, particularly a technical program, five years after graduation, students can make over $100,000 per year in uh, Odessa, Texas, and in West Texas. So we think that's an, an impressive stat, and I think that we're number one in the country in that regard as we invest in those students. So we have become a really, really highly effective community college over the last six or seven years. Uh, I, I arrived in Odessa about 11 years ago. Uh, we were able to pass a bond about eight years ago. And then about six years ago, the state of Texas said, you're not growing fast enough, Odessa College, and we're going to defund you. That's what a part of the legislature said. The House of Representatives, uh, they noted, we're not going to fund you. So we had uh, cameras on campus and others saying Odessa College is going to close and this and that. That was during the Great Recession, as you recall. And, and we think that that was a message that was sent by one party or the other uh, trying to make a point. But for us, it really it was serious business. So what I decided and what our team decided was that we're going to become the best college in the country. We can't control how much we're going to grow, even though we've grown a lot in the last six years. But we can control how effective we are, how amazing we are as a college. And if they want to close us at that point, then that's fine. So we've embarked on a journey to become outstanding. And we are getting closer and closer to there. I will never tell you that we've arrived. Uh, but we're hopeful to win the Aspen Prize and other awards. We've been honored in a lot of situations. And I want to share with you some of the things that we do that make us uh, a bit different from others. We begin by offering the first class free to any person who wants to become a part of Odessa College. If you want to attend our college, no matter whether you live in our district or whether you live anywhere else in the country or the world, your first class is free because we think our product is so good that we want you to come and become a part of that. So we offer that to everyone. Uh, we also have a program for uh, uh, online effectiveness that's very good. But when, when we register you, we, we register you for whatever that is that you want. If you only want one class, which most of our students don't want, then we'll register you for that. But if you really want a degree or a certificate, we register you for the entire program, whether that's four or five semesters. And then you have to opt out. What most colleges do, and most of you have had this experience, you register, or in colleges and universities, you register, then you make it through that semester, you survive, and then we try to figure out, well, do you want to do this again? Well, registration's here, so show up. That's not what we do. We have a plan for you, we have a pathway for you, you work with a success coach, which we'll speak to in a moment, and then you chart a path, and we register you through that. Much like with SiriusXM and others for you, uh, they want they want to keep you engaged. I'll use that term. That's what we do with our that we do with our students. We bring them into meta majors. So we know that they don't know many of them don't know exactly what they want. So we get close. Uh, we come to an area of study, and then from there we refine it forward. Keep in mind that many of our students don't have individuals at home who have. Uh, experiences in colleges and universities. They don't know what the difference between three hours is and one hour, four hours. They don't know what a major means. They don't, uh, they don't know what a minor means. So we take them, we bring them in, and then we provide them with coaches. And those coaches, uh, through a first, ex a first year experience class, they take them and they talk to them about many of those things that you would talk to your children about, those of you who've been through college. We, we then offer, uh, again, we do the first class free. We have a drive to success program that we have for students, which means we're the place that gives away cars to our students. Uh, if you come, come in, do the right things, go to events, go for tutoring, and do those types of things that we know will help to make you more successful, we give you points or entries into a drawing. Thus far, we've given away 10 cars over the last nine years. Uh, for our 10th anniversary, and we're in that year, we're going to give away both a Ford Mustang, since we are the Wranglers, we give away Mustangs routinely, but we're also going to give away a, an F-150. We thought we'd throw a pickup truck in, just because. <laughs> and here's the sweet spot of that. We don't use any of the college's funds for that. We have individuals in the community who've joined forces with us and who said, we love what you're doing, we appreciate what's going on at the college, let us help and we get donations for, for many of the things that we do. 
we have a program that assists students in online education. We don't simply uh, believe that you can that every student can be successful with online education. We know that in most colleges there's a disparity point where uh, about, of about 30 percent in effectiveness between face to face and online instruction. Our students, we only have a difference of about two or three percent because we teach faculty members and we teach students how we teach faculty members how to offer online and co online courses effectively and we teach our students how to take those courses and what to do and how to remain engaged. Another thing that we've done that's, <clears throat> that's somewhat radical is we have divided the semester into two eight-week terms. So 80% of our courses are not taught in that long 16-week semester. We break it down for them. If you can recall, when you were in school, after about four or five weeks, what happened? You need coffee. <laughs> Lots. Yes. And because you were staying up, you were cramming, right? You had papers due, you had exams. And, and, and it's like a grand cons conspiracy because all of your faculty members got together and decided this is the week that we're going to do all of this if we really want to hurt students. No, that's, <laughs> that's not why they do it. But that's what's happened. Uh, and if you think about it, that's when students start to go back home or fall out of school or become disengaged. At our place, it's, we encourage you to only take two courses during each term. Each term, only take two courses, focus on that. And then the next term, take two courses, focus on that. The next term, take two courses, we call it a two-step, we're in Texas, go figure. <laughs> so with that method, we can get you through in two years if you want to be full-time, or we can get you through in three years if you want to be part-time, but we can, we can help you to get through school very effectively and again, if you don't like college algebra, if you don't like biology, why don't you take that alone by itself as a standalone and then take three courses during that next term if that's a good mix for you. We allow you to create a menu. Community colleges can do so much more and uh, we, we need to be much more creative. Again, I told the group I could speak for an hour on this stuff so I will stop as I wind down and I'll, be, I'll answer questions in a moment. But we can be so much more effective if we, if we help the people more, if we reach out, if we're, if we're more inclusive, and if we meet students where they are. And that's what we're trying to do at Odessa College. Thank you. And uh, F-150s don't hurt either. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you for that, Greg. Uh, many college students, community college, college, uh, have kids. And that could prevent them from getting to class or working because childcare is so darn expensive in the United States. And Beth has some data on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, expenses from both sides. I'm going to recall a conversation I had with the director of my daughter's childcare center last year, where I said, You know, it feels like I pay way too much for childcare, but you charge way too little. When I try to do the math in my head of how she makes money, how she, prov how she makes any income for herself, given all the people that are hired and the facilities and the supplies and the insurance, I can't get, I can't understand how she meets her bottom line on what we pay. But first we start with the um, share of families with young children who pay more than 10% of their income for childcare. And I'm going to focus on the um, difference um, between rural and urban, and you see, if, I, I can't see them from here, but on the far left side, I have the bars for below 100% of poverty. And half of families below poverty pay more than 10% of their income on childcare. And we sort of dub these families as childcare cost burden. And I should say, this is a pretty conservative estimate. Um, we started this research about a year and a half ago, and right around that time, the Department of Health and Human Services was switching from a threshold of 10% recommended to a threshold of only 7%. So if we went with that threshold, these numbers would be even higher. I should also caveat that this is among families with young children who pay for childcare. This doesn't include families who can't afford childcare and either tag team with a spouse, you know, rely on a relative or a friend, or who simply don't work because the childcare costs are prohibitive. Another way we looked at this was to look at how many families would be would not be poor if they didn't have to pay for childcare. The extent to which childcare expenses were taking away from family resources and pushing families into poverty. Um, across the nation, about a third of poor families were pushed into poverty by childcare expenses. 
um, slightly fewer, about one in four in non-Metro America than in Metro America. Um, we also look at the median and percentile distribution of hourly earnings, hourly wages among child care workers. And the, the, the takeaway points here are two. One, wages are lower in rural than urban America. That's not entirely surprising. But the wages are really low. Even in the top 10% of, of earners, we get to about $16 an hour. Very low wages for someone who's, you know, these are people who have more education, who've been in the field for a long time. Other challenges um, deal with attrition in the, in the child care workforce. Um, I, I highlight this report. We haven't done work directly on this, but somewhere between 15 to 25 percent or so of child care workers turn over in a given year, according to this study. Um, and they also highlight the very low work wages of the child care workforce. Thank you. It's mind blowing to think about how even the highest paid child care workers are struggling to get by. And Sheila is doing some great work on this in North Carolina. Let's, let's hear what's going on. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here today and, and glad to be whispering to you about the quiet Christ. <laughs> but I'm not going to be quiet at all. I'm going to speak very loudly and very robust. It is such a treat to, become, to come behind the data person and say, amen. I like the numbers. <laughs> I like your studies. I like all your statistics. I can't tell you enough how much I do, and, and we're going to talk some about that. Um, child care is a very complex system, and when Janet tells us that that's, that's a bit untraditional if we're going to talk about how do we move jobs forward in rural America, well, for me, it's a very exciting time because for a long time in the early childhood world, we've been saying that when parents have a job, they can't get there if childcare is not provided, if it's not accessible, if it's not affordable, and then certainly it needs to be of high quality so that it's good for the children. So we have to have in our rural communities a robust early childhood system. If we roll that forward just a few more years and think about the future, the one thing that is critical is that the research now shows us empirically that what happens with brain architecture in children from zero to five is fundamental to their ability to be successful in public school and certainly in later, in later college. So it's critical that we put a teacher who can work well with children zero to five, who understands learning theory and understands growth and development of young children in that classroom, what are we going to pay her? How are we going to be able to retain her in that classroom? And then how are we going to develop an early childhood system that will support our young children and support our employers who need parents in the workforce and they need childcare to be there? I come from Western North Carolina, and I come from Jackson County. Jackson County's claim to fame is uh, Western Carolina University, is our local university, and we're the home of the Cherokee Indian Reservation. Uh, you may know our part of the state because the Great Smoky Mountains are there, which is the most visited national park in the national park system. So that's where North, Western North Carolina is. My service area is seven small rural counties, the smallest of which has a population of a little bit over 8,000 people. North Carolina as a state, of course, has a population of over 10 million people. The service area that I work in, the seven counties, have a combined population of under 200,000. So we are certainly very rural. We believe, because we've been doing good, high-quality early childhood for a very long time, that that offers many of the solutions to preparing tomorrow's workforce and also to stabilizing the workforce of parents today. We are in the heart of Appalachia. We started, our agency started in 1972 with some early anti-poverty funds that developed some of our first comprehensive child development programs. This summer we celebrated a 45th anniversary. So we've been doing early childhood in Western North Carolina for, for quite some time. It's a difficult program to do, number one, because it's inadequately funded, woefully funded, 
And what we do is we put a patchwork of funding streams together to try to make early childhood work. We sometimes call it a quilted pattern because we've taken a little piece here and a little piece here and we've blended this stream and we've added on this stream and it's such a fragile net that we try to put together that if, if you take a deep breath, some days you think this fabric will rip and then we won't have what, what we need for our early, early childhood systems. Some of the strategies that we've used that have been very successful of us, in North Carolina, we're very fortunate to have a woman named Sue Russell who has a great vision around what defines successful and effective early childhood system. Sue works in Chapel Hill at Child Care Services Association, and two of the programs that, that she developed have been incredibly beneficial to our part of the state. She developed the TEACH program and the wages program. Both of these programs have to do with educational attainment for the child care worker, blending that together with a better compensation for the early childhood worker, and then partnering together agencies who hire early childhood workers and sponsor them so that as women come into the workforce, they can develop a career path where they have additional educational achievement, their compensation goes up, and these programs support workers working toward a two-year degree or a four-year degree so that there is a career path. What we see happening with these programs is these teachers are staying in their jobs. You heard Beth <laughs> talk about a, a turnover rate in early childhood that moves from 10 to 25%. For our women who are a part of the Teach and Wages program, in most, in many communities, that, that attrition rate is as low as 10%. Just huge change, and we're very, very uh, proud of that. Those, those two programs work together to be very successful in worker retainment. We have other strategies in, in our community which uh, in North Carolina, Governor Jim Hunt, about 20 years ago, developed a Smart Start. And Smart Start is a private-public partnership where employers, too, said we need the early childhood system to be stable and to be robust. And we partnered with corporations and we partnered with uh, government and, and civic institutions in our state to say we have to put a foundation to our early childhood program, and those have, have been wonderful partnerships. We use in my community an early childhood program that's Nurse Family Partnership, where nurses are paired with high-risk pregnancies, and they work with first-time moms to offer not only good health practices, but also good early childhood practices. And we're working with those young moms and putting them back into school programs, higher education programs, are preparing them for the jobs. So it's a multidisciplined approach that lets us look at what do our employers need, what do our young children need, and then how do we fund this? How do we bring this together? To, to build an early childhood program that will work in a rural community, and it's very, very hard in a rural community where the resources are much are much less. Thank you, Sheila. And you you had told me that uh, the people who work for you, who happen to be mostly women, would come up to you in the past and say, "I want to stay in this field, but it's just too." it's too expensive out there and I'm yes. not making enough money. Yes, so very, very rarely do uh, the people who come to early childhood leave because they don't like the work anymore. They leave because they have bills to pay. They leave because they have children who also need to go to college and they need to be financially prepared for that. Most people who work in early childhood love the work. Thank you for your all right, so we, we've talked about education, we've gotten to child care. Uh, now you have a job, but it's still tough to get by. Uh, let's hear from Beth on the state of the working poor. Sure, so I'm gonna start by showing you some poverty rates here. And um, on the left-hand side are rural poverty rates. And the first is simply the poverty rate across non-metropolitan counties 
in the US. And um, in non-Metro America, the native born population is, is doing better, is, is less poor than the foreign born. But I want to point out that 8% of those working part time are still poor. And 6.1%, or more than 1 in 20 people working full time year round is in poverty. And I just want to breathe for a second because that's a pretty startling number when we think about the ways we want to encourage work and encourage people to be attached to the labor force over, over time and for a full, for, at full employment. These are people who've met that bar and are still living below the, the very low poverty threshold. When we flip things and look at the population of poor people by their work status, we see that across, across the charts there's some variation, but roughly half are not working, and roughly half are working either full-time full or more often part-time. And this holds true in rural as well as urban America for both groups that I looked at. When, when we look, this is not our work, but, but, but some, some other work um, cited here. And when employers are asked about absenteeism and what the big, biggest three barriers to work are, these are employers of TANF recipients, so employers of very low wage workers. Their responses are pretty much in line with TANF recipients themselves identifying barriers to work. The biggest one by far is childcare. Um, Transportation and physical health um, challenges round out the top three, um, but childcare is 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 not surprisingly highlighted. I just want to end with a quote from um, one service provider in rural New England, and I'll read the quote and then I want to comment on it briefly. There isn't one tipping point. That's really a middle class phenomenon. When you're stretched as th thin as she was, anything could be a tipping point. Her her check not coming, her boyfriend blowing up at her. The net was so frail. And for the working poor, I think this is a really apt quote because they're the people who are living <coughs> paycheck to paycheck but still not really able to meet their needs. They're not typically able to put away any money for, for um, a crisis that might come up. So the car not starting might mean a loss of a job because they can't get to work on time. Or a child care worker being sick if they're not in a licensed center. There may not be a backup. Um, there are a, or, or their child being sick and, and not being allowed to go to child care. That there are so many things, so many points at which things could fall apart for these families. That, that, that the working poor and even up through 100, 200% of poverty, sometimes even higher depending on the cost of living, are in, in such a state of precarity that, that, that working requires so many other things to fall into place and to be going just right. Thank you, Beth. So Lynn at uh, the United Way in Michigan uh, has been working on this program that's made all the difference in one rural community. Could you tell us how that has worked and how that is as making it you know, just more stable to stay in a job where you live? Yes, thank you. Thank you, and I would like to also echo um, Beth's um, comments about the tipping point and people just being one way from a disaster in their, in their community. I also want to thank Janet and Travis for giving me the opportunity in the um, Aspen Institute to talk about the Lakeshore Employer Resource Network of Mason County. Um, it's um, something I'm very passionate about, and I think you will, will get a flavor for what we're working on. Um, before I get into um, what the Lakeshore Employer Resource Network of Mason County is, we also refer to that as LEARN. So if I talk about that in an acronym form, you'll know what I'm referring to is that a little bit about Mason County, Michigan. We are located on the north northwest um, side of Michigan um, on, on Lake Michigan. We are kind of known for the Lake Michigan car ferry that travels across um, Lake Michigan from Ludington um, to Manitowoc, Wisconsin every year. The population of our county is just over um, 28,000 people, so we're very small. and. Um, the average median household income in Mason County is just over 42000 So to put that in context of an hourly wage, that would be um, a household making about $22 an hour or two, if there was two working people, making about $11 each. 15% um, of the people that live in Mason County live in poverty, and 25% of the households live within the ALICE threshold. And ALICE stands for Asset Limited Constraint Employed. And it is a study that's put out, and there's 15 other states 
in um, the nation that also have the study completed. And Alice is a person that is working, but they just don't make enough money um, to make ends meet. So they fall around, right around 200% um, of poverty would be a good way to think about Alice. Our unemployment rate right now is about 5%, which is just a little bit higher than the state and national average. But when we began um, four years ago, um, developing LEARN, our unemployment rate was 9%. And how we started with LEARN was with a private-public partnership. Um, the, we have a family um, private foundation called the Pennies from Heaven Foundation. And they had called me one day and asked, what are the most critical needs in the community? And I said to think different. And so this is, where we, this is how we began our journey on thinking different, differently. So the Pennies from Heaven Foundation United Way of Mason County and 12 local employers came together. So while United Way of Mason County may be the administrator of the program and maybe hire the success coach, I don't, it's not, we don't own the program. It's really the community's program and it's, it's being able to think about in terms of we and not me and forming these um, partnerships. So in 2013, what we did, how we started, is we had a gentleman by the name of Fred Keller, who is the CEO and founder of Cascade Engineering, come to talk um, to a group of CEOs, educators, and some health and human service providers about how people in the private sector or employers have more of an obligation in their communities than to hire people, but they also have a social capital obligation and making sure that, pe that we have a strong, healthy community. And so from that, we had 12 employers agree to come together. And what they do at um, Cascade Engineering is that he has an on-site success coach or a welfare to career program. And she works with employees um, that are on the career ladder on how to be successful and help them to remove barriers that can help them be, to be successful at work. But his company is so large that he can afford to hire just uh, one person to serve his company. Where in our community, we couldn't individually come to get, just individually hire a success coach each company. So the 12 companies agreed to come together and that's where we hired a success coach to serve the 12 companies. And, but along with that, um, for the funding for that, we agreed that these 12 employers that we thought were gonna put the proof in the pudding first and we didn't want to worry about funding. So the Pennies from Heaven Foundation and United Way of Mason County agreed to funding the, fund the initiative for three years before asking the participating companies to, um, to pay up. But with that came that they also had to agree to the employers had to agree to set, um, attend 16 hours of leadership management and personal effectiveness and the hidden rules of economic class, which I'll get to in a little bit um, later, um, better, um, to attend that training. So the CEOs and upper management attended those 16 hours of training. And then we began to develop um, our, began to develop LEARN. And so it really consists of three components. We have a, an on-site success coach, we have training and education, and we have a loan program. So the role of the success coach is that she works full time, and she works in the 12 companies, um, either two to four hours to week, depending on the size of the company. And just to give you, give you a frame of re reference, the 12 companies vary in the types of, um, of employment, from healthcare all the way to manufacturing and they vary in different sizes. Our largest company is between five and 600 employees and our smallest is 30 employees. So she works with a wide variety of people and she's available on site. I like to say that she has an office on wheels. So she has her cell phone, her copy machine, her, um, or her printer, I'm sorry, her printer, her scanner and laptop. And so she's, and she's there to remove, help employees remove barriers. So if they're having a life issue or a performance type issue, they can come to see, her name is Nicole, they can come and see Nicole to just to help to solve those problems or be an advocate for them. So if it's an attendance related issue, she may see them and talk to them about how come you're missing work and meeting the, the employee where they're at. And it could be because I don't have reliable tra transportation. It could be because I have a childcare issue. And so she would work on them and helping to solve that. Okay, let's create a backup childcare plan. 
okay, can we find a ride share program? Because we, in our county, we don't have countywide transportation. So she may solve a lot of those types of issues. And so it just really depends. The other part that she really works on is government na navigation. You know, our, to get through the bureaucracy of our nonprofit organizations is difficult at best. And so she works with them. They may find that um, my doctor doesn't take my type of Medicaid. What do I do? So she may work with Department of Health and, um, Sir, Department of Health and Human Services on, you know, on bridging that gap and we're removing that barrier for them. So she does all those types of things. And I think what's really important about Nicole's role, and it's, a, it's about really building the relationship. It's all about the relationship and accepting people for where they're at and not judging them and helping them to solve their problems. The second part, if you recall back, I said that we, they needed to go, the CEOs and leadership had to go through um, 16 hours of leadership development and training. Well, we reduce it. We, the, after that training, the CEOs wanted to provide that training throughout the company um, so that all employees would receive that training. But we knew that 16 hours were, was too much. And so we narrowed that down to eight hours. So Nicole is a certified trainer in Bridges Out of Poverty. And she, um, so she provides that training to the employees three different times um, throughout the year. And one of the trainings is um, conflict resolution and communication. Another training is um, making work relationships work. And then the third training is around the hidden rules of economic class, which was um, developed by Dr. Ruby Payne. And it's something that we do all kind of embrace all of our work in. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the hidden rules of economic class, but it's really about how our society is really built across, uh, built around middle class values in the hidden rules of economic class. And we have all of our hidden rules, but people in poverty don't understand what our hidden rules are. And so um, it's about teaching, um, and, and we don't understand the hidden rules of people in poverty. So it's about teaching each other how, what the hidden rules of people are in poverty and with the hidden rules of our economic class so that we can learn how to work better together. The second part of the program, that, or the third part of the program is a loan program that we have. And we have a loan program with a community bank and the employee, if they are, are struggling with some type of life issue, their car breaks down but they don't have enough money to get it fixed or their water heater breaks but they don't have enough money to buy it, they can go see Nicole and receive um, a loan up to $1,000 through a community bank. She works with them on um, creating a budget. She talks to the HR directors about, about um, if they're an employee in good standing or not, and then um, they can receive a loan. And that loan is paid, up to, um, is paid back through payroll deduction, and at the same time, they're putting $10 a week towards that to build a savings account. So when they're done paying back the loan over the course of the year, they've learned how to get bank, they build some credit, and they have a $500 savings account. And so many of those employees continue to put that $10 away through payroll deduction each month because they're used to, to paying it. And that um, program, we, I believe, have, since we started it, have issued 193 loans and um, have only had 11 defaults. So that's about a 94% um, success rate on that. For the people that see Nicole, about 95% um, percent of them retain their job. Um, so it ha does have a high retention rate. And um, let me see, the other thing I wanted to highlight was... Well, do you know how much money these companies save when people aren't quitting? I understand someone leaving is quite costly, so this is an economic initiative as well, something that just sounds like the right thing to right. do. Right, so when you figure that the cost of turnover, which is probably low, is about $3,000 per employee, the return on investment is about um, 276%. So the majority of the companies that do utilize the success coach, um, do, they do see a high return on investment from that. We also hear that about 81.5% of the employees that attend the training would recommend those three types of training, that eight hour of training to their coworkers. And we also see that about 43%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but this is something that really can't be measured, of HR directors say that they um, save two to three hours per week in time that they don't have to be managing 
um, personal type issue with their employees. And so, again, this is just one of the first initiatives that we've done in our community um, on this journey for us to become um, a community of choice. Thank you, Lynn. All right, so I have a couple questions for the group. Um, anyone feel free to answer. One thing I'm curious about is, since you've started these programs, what kind of feedback have you gotten from people in the community? You know, what kind of concrete ways have their lives changed? Anyone go first? I think for us, um, for employees in the company, they really look now like, if they're thinking about switching jobs, they're starting to look at to see, well, does that company um, are they a member company of, of LEARN or not? Because they see that as a benefit in uh, being able to go to the success coach if they need help or if they need assistance anyways, because things like the loan program and seeing the success coach is really only available to those members of the, the companies. We, we've had a lot of positive feedback, both locally and, and nationwide. Uh, we've, we've garnered a lot of support. I talked about the, the defunding scare uh, that we dealt with six years ago. We were able to beat that back, and the Senate was supportive, and the governor was supportive, supportive and we moved forward. Uh, now we have the Chamber of Commerce in our area is very supportive of what we do. They, they tout us. They bring uh, business and industry uh, potential uh, folks who are coming in looking at, at relocating to our area. They bring them by our college. They, they use us as a wonderful resource. Uh, there's a, 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 among a number of stories, I'll tell you one story, we had a, a young man who was struggling to make it and, and provide for his family. Uh, he went through our instrumentation and automation program. Uh, from that program, he was then recruited by a number of companies to go to work there. Uh, he's had two jobs since he left us uh, three years ago, and uh, he's now making uh, well over $100,000, doing well with his family. Uh, things are good. So one of the ways... What, what, another thing I'll share is I, I, I love these programs that helps to help uh, the community members and that uh, provide them with assistance and support. And at the same time, what we have to do is find ways for people to double their income, triple their income, quadruple their income, and we need to be that resource for them, and that's what we can do at community colleges. And Greg, you hit on something. Um, I'm hearing from employers nationwide that there is somewhat of a labor shortage, especially around manufacturing. Well, that's counterintuitive when you hear about these jobs disappearing. But the hiring managers I speak to say, well, we're not finding people with the skills, with the skills. You say that young man enrolled in an automation course. Are you hearing from more private companies? Yes, there, there is a gap. There is a, definitely a skills gap. And uh, we, can, we can help you to, to feel that. Uh, I was listening to a program the other day I was, as I was driving back from a meeting in Austin, which is about a six-hour drive, and uh, so I have my Sirius XM radio on, and I'm listening to a program, and they're talking about this program that San Quentin has uh, for these uh, offenders who are about to leave uh, prison, and it's called The Last Mile. And in that last mile, they teach them coding, uh, computer coding, and these individuals are paid $16 during that last six months or a year or so while they're incarcerated and then they, the recidivism rate is zero once they get out. Wow. So what I said is what we need to start is a first mile program. Let's avoid the prison part <laughs> <laughs> and let's put people to work so that they can do great things without having to go through that other experience or have our, our citizens uh, go through the experience of, of dealing with them and let's support them, let's do something first mile and let's get those skills so that they can go to work and take care of their families and have futures. Absolutely. Well, uh, here's another question. I, I've heard, and I think I, I heard this from you, Lynn, that after you guys launched the network, you know, um, you funded the first round with philanthropy, another county picked up the model and, and companies financed it. Is that correct? Right. So the company just to the south of us, they have just recently started an ERN or an employer resource network. And I believe they have six companies, and all the companies themselves are, are, have put their resources together to hire the success coach. And since our three years is up, now our program is being funded by the, a combination of the employers, United Way of Mason County, and then the Pennies from Heaven Foundation. Mm -hmm. And Sheila, have you seen your, um, your program, your wage supplementing programs, um, or the programs that encourage more education spread to areas beyond West North Carolina? We have. Uh, 
this program is statewide in North Carolina. In fact, for the TEACH program, we actually have TEACH operating in 23 states in the nation. Uh, so we've had quite, quite a bit of expansion with TEACH. The wages program operates, of course, in North Carolina mm -hmm. and then also in four other states. So as, as various states are, are certainly trying to attack uh, the child turnover rate and, and uh, how to get better trained teachers into our classrooms, we're seeing great expansion with both of those programs. Before I signed up for today's event, I hadn't heard of these programs, and I was so amazed by what I was reading. Uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, are there people reaching out asking, how can we adopt this policy or this strategy? And uh, the second part of that question is, how are you sort of promoting the idea to help these, these families in rural communities? Certainly. We will uh, send the website uh, for uh, Teach Early Childhood and and make that aware and, and certainly we, we want to share what we've uh, learned in North Carolina with any states who are uh, interested and, and feel that, that's a, that it's a good model for them. We, we, just, we were talking about participant feedback and I, I can't say enough how often I read our annual reports and the uh, people who are teach and wages participants write their stories and they just really are heart touching in terms of I was able to stay in this field or I was able to do this for my family because or the commitment and the passion with which they do this work and it's almost like it was the tipping point in a positive way that kept them in the field and made them be able to be successful. And here's a question for each of you. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to lawmakers, business owners, people who want to help out in rural communities? You know, it can, it can seem so hard to just get started. What would you tell them? For me, um, I think um, that I think it's important that in all of our work, everything is interrelated and interconnected. You know, um, when people are living in poverty, um, we can't have the best educational system and then expect people in poverty to, to just lift themselves up. So I just think it's, everything that we do is interrelated and inter interconnected. And when people, when we set our, our legislators and stuff, I think it's important for us to be able to do our work across sectors so that we can form partnerships and not con constrain us by um, rules and regulations that almost hinder us from wanting to collaborate and work together. I, I would say that good enough is never good enough. Uh, if, if you think about um, someone who was producing um, cellular phones uh, about 10 years ago, and I won't name a name, but they were doing really, really well, and, and most of you probably had those phones, and then someone came up with a better idea, a different idea, and now most of you have those phones in your pocket and you know that was Apple. So don't be afraid of a crisis. Don't be afraid of an opportunity. Do something. We all need, uh, we, we all need that next idea. That's what makes America what it is. We're, we're looking for that next big thing, that next little thing, that next thing that moves the needle. Uh, we're now at a point, because of the changes we've made, where 96% of the students who start one of our courses complete that course, 96%. That's, that compares to any college or university in the nation, 96%. And 81.5% of those students complete those courses uh, with an A, B, or C. They have success in those courses. So there's good, and that's regardless of uh, race, that's regardless of gender, that's regardless of uh, whether they started with dev ed or not. Uh, that's regardless of whether they're pale recipients, which means that they are uh, somewhat in poverty. Uh, all of that, you factor all of that in, 96%, 81.5. We can do things to move the needle if we work together and if we're innovative. And quick question before we get to Sheila. At what point did you guys start offering free first courses? We started that about eight years ago. And what kind of difference has that made? It's made a tremendous difference. Uh, it gives me a wonderful talking point. Uh, and uh, it, it, allows, it allows me to tell every person you can go to college. 
Now, here's the thing. What if you're in poverty? This is the, this is the best use of it. If you're in poverty, I go to your school or I go to your, um, your community event, whatever. I tell you, you can go to college. Come on. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Then if you are in a situation where you don't have great funding, we then have two to four months to work on the payout process so that we can get you started, where you find out you can do this, and then there is help out there for you. We also can invite you to our scholarship department, different other parts of the college, but we can say with a good heart, come on in, we can help you, let's get started. You have a scholarship to come to our school now, let's go. So that's, it's made a tremendous difference. Our enrollment, well we have, let's say we were graduating, and I'll, I'll miss these numbers a little bit, 10 years ago, I've been there 10, 11 years, but 10 years ago we were graduating about 400 people, or four to 500 people per year. Now we're graduating 12 to 1,400 people per year. Wow. That's the difference. And Sheila, uh, what kind of advice would you have? I think the advice that, that I would give to someone who is in a rural community and you are an early childhood leader is first look at locally what's happening. You need to connect with the people who make decisions in your community. You need to be able to talk to your chamber of commerce. You need to be able to talk to your business and industry developer. You need to talk on a regular basis to your county manager. You need to talk with your public schools. You need to talk with the other child care people in your community. One thing that happens in child care is we deliver child care by for-profit programs, non-profit programs, church-operated programs, small family daycare homes, and there's not a lot of infrastructure that weaves those programs together in a local community. So anything that you can do, is, as you said about collaboration, anything that you can do in terms of collaborating is a good thing locally. You need to say, I'm here and this is what I do. You need me and I need you. On a bigger scale, you need to know what's happening in your state. Much of the funding that comes into your state either comes from your state funding or from the federal government through your state. In Western North Carolina, I live 300 miles from Raleigh. It's not easy for me to go to Raleigh for a meeting. But if I don't go, if I'm not sitting at the table when public policy is developed, then rural has no voice. So I have to make that travel, I have to stay overnight, I have to miss work, and it, it costs me a lot. In our community, we do a lot of regional work so that our small rural communities can sometimes go with a unified voice. It is well worth the trip to be in on making policy, and I can assure you that it takes fewer trips to make good policy than it does to undo bad policy. <laughs> so link with, your, link with your local state policy and build that robust system question from that. Now, uh, how, do you, how do you feel funding uh, might change or not under the current administration? Have there been any signals that you should anticipate? Uh, less funding, more money? Well, I just always have to be very positive and say that we believe that data and research will hold the key. And everything that's happening in the world of early childhood says that we have to concentrate on zero to five. So that might be as far as I go with that, is to say that the research and the data tells us that early childhood is the best investment you can make. Wonderful. How about we take some questions? Sure. Actually, um, I'm going to pose the first one. Is this on there? Okay. I don't think it is. Okay, now it's on. Uh, I, I'm going to pose the first one because I think there's one thing. Um, Sheila, I'm not sure you explained the wages in the TEACH program. You talked about them, but I, would you just articulate for everyone what they provide to child care providers? Sure, yes. Um, the wages in TEACH program is a, their programs that will pay for continuing education for, for women who are, for employees who are working in early childhood programs. Sometimes it is state funded, sometimes it is funded through philanthropy, and it is a, a joint program with the owner operator of the child care facility through a contract with the participant. And through TEACH, it's, it's all about 
paying for the college participation to attain either a two-year program, a two-year degree, or a four-year degree. Wages is a complimentary program which will actually pay a salary bonus after those courses have been completed. That to the child care worker? Yes, right. to the, directly to the child care worker. Thank Questions? You. In the room? Questions? We have one from the... It's, it's from the web, but it's also from the room. Uh, it, one, if each of you could provide one piece of advice um, that you would give to rural employers about how they could better retain and hire uh, rural workers. What's, what's one piece of advice you would give rural employers? I think one, one um, bit of advice, and we've talked about this with some of our employers, is to really look at your own policies um, that that, inst that create barriers um, from employees, like looking at attendance policies, things that you have control over that maybe would make you have a stronger workforce if they weren't so stringent. So for example, if an attendance policy is, is that if you are sick, you have to go to your doctor, you know, you have to call in 24 hours in advance and then you have to bring back a doctor's note. Well, for people that are living in poverty, that's probably not very realistic. And, um, and, and are you still, do you hold that same standard for people that are in upper management um, in, your, in your company? And if not, could you really hold to that? So I just think looking at your own internal policies that you have control over, which may be, pre, may be creating barriers for people from being successful. I would say support uh, your people, much like you've heard here, where we you go, go out of your way to be supportive, do everything that you can to remove uh, the barriers that really don't need to be there, the problems, the processes that really don't need to be there. Try to clean up your shop as much as you can. And I think in addition to that, I would say communication. Uh, just like with any uh, relationship, communication is very important. Uh, when you're making major decisions, when you're making minor decisions, when you're doing things that could be seen as disruptive, try to enhance communication greatly. Try to let people know ahead of time if you can. Try to have uh, meetings where you bring the teams together and where you can share what's going on so that you then can take questions that uh, from the group that might be uh, festering or might be issues that are festering and you can you can put a, a, a stop or a halt or shine some light on a situation I think communication is very very important I, I certainly agree with the, the su suggestions that are there support and communication is, is the very best thing I, I think the thing that works well in a rural community is is to have in one of those first interviews something which says what do you anticipate will be a barrier to your being a successful employee for us. And if you can identify that beforehand, then you already are halfway there towards solving what that issue is going to be. And if as an employer, you can participate in community solutions, the loyalty that you gain from your employees from saying, yes, we see that as a barrier and I'm on a committee or I go to a meeting once a month that talks about that. You're, it's, the loyalty you get from your employees is so enhanced when they know that you understand what those uh, problems may be and you're working with them. Okay, I want to remind people who are watching uh, via live stream, hashtag rural innovation to send in questions, hashtag rural innovation. Questions in the room? Okay. I'm gonna run over here. <laughs> Sorry for blocking the camera for a moment. Actually, the, uh, when it comes to rural or child care, um, I hear a lot about quality in child care, which I understand, but as a parent of uh, three-year-olds looking for child care right now, I also feel like it's become so formalized that that quality becomes more that the kids jump through hoops, standards, and they've lost play, they've lost nature. And how do you balance that as a, as a rural child care provider? Thank you, that's an excellent question. I, I certainly come from the school that believes that play is, is the best learning that a child does. And I, and I think that some of it is in understanding how children learn and develop. 
I, I remember uh, oftentimes looking out my office window, which faces a playground, and I see children in a sandbox who are measuring and scooping, and that's math. But those children don't know that's math. They're having a good time. And whether they feel it half full or feel it part of the way full or understand when it spills over, it is experiential play and it is, it is what happens. I, I think uh, the more we learn about brain development, the more we stay away from those kinds of rigid programs that say a child must do this at this age and, and we really do embrace that exploratory play. Okay, questions? Hi, Sheila. Um, you mentioned this a little bit, but I was wondering if you could expand on it. Um, the engagement that you've had with employers and uh, the need for employers to have uh, affordable, accessible child care for their employees in order to be able to have the workforce they need. Uh, so could you just talk a little bit more about how uh, employers in the private sector have been engaged in, in some of the work that you're doing and, and how they're supporting it. That'd be great. Okay. One of the things that I found out over the years is that most employers in the business community don't have a clue as to what makes childcare work. The things that they don't understand, number one, is what childcare teachers make. So they don't understand the turnover rates, nor do they understand what the parents' expectation of childcare is or the cost of childcare. So, and I, I don't mean that in a negative way at all. I just mean that we are learning more about how we carry our message successfully to the business community. I try to sit on as many business-related uh, committees as I can so I can talk about those kinds of things. But, but the engagement, I think, is just beginning to happen because it's almost like jack of all trades, master of none. We're educators, but at the same time, we also have businesses to run, and at the same time, we also have to be able to speak a language that the business community can understand when what most women really started out was saying, oh, I love children. So it's pretty complex, but we're trying, I think, as a profession to step back and really understand the financing of childcare and how, how we make that work. I hope I didn't ramble. Yeah, here's another question from, uh, from the, uh, well, the, the sphere, the sphere <laughs> out there, right? I never know what to call it anymore. It changes names regularly. And it's sort of related to Andrew's question. What's been your relationship with your local economic development professionals and programs? So, and, and you know, this makes me think of something I was thinking as well, too. Lynn mentioned, you said, I forget, at the beginning of your story, you said something about we had to do something differently, right? And you've all figured out you had to do something differently and analyzed, in many ways, the system as it existed. It'd be really interesting, besides knowing what your relationship was the, with the economic development professionals is, is what method did you use and with whom did you sit down to analyze that system to figure out what you were going to do? So you can answer both of those questions. Go ahead. It, it is a, I, I think or, and hope that it, it should be a very natural relationship between your local community college and your economic development people. That's, that's what we have in Odessa. It is, we, I, I meet with them, uh, I'm, I'm active with the chamber, I, uh, we have a person who sits on the chamber board, um, and that arm comes from our, our chamber in, in our community. Was, was that true when you started? Was that true when you, no, you remember no, back not. in the recession and the, you no, were about was, to be closed? It was, yeah, it was never uh -huh. about to be closed. It was, it was a scare. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we pushed back the scare. But uh, it, was, uh, it, it was not that way. And there were issues between the college and uh, some of those folks before that was, it, there were unmet needs. We, we were not as active as we needed to be. We were not doing what we needed to do. And uh, we, we were able to change that. So not only do we have that economic development partnership, we, we want to partner with the entire community. Let me go back to something I said a little bit earlier. 
I said, one, and I said, I really appreciate the support that's given to people in our communities, but what you also need to do is go out and get a job where you can triple and et cetera your income. Many of our students, we keep this in mind, cannot do that without these resources. I want to make sure we have that in context. If you don't have the child care in place, if you don't have the community support pieces in place, if you don't have the United Way and all those efforts, you, you, you can't do it because you're, you're finding yourself in a hole and you're probably still digging and you just can't find your way out. So it's about not only connecting with the economic uh, development folks, the chamber, but it's also about connecting with those folks who, who lend a helping hand to individuals who are struggling. One other point I'll make, not only did we not have a great relationship with the Chamber of Commerce, we didn't have a great relationship with many in our community. We, at that point, 10 years ago, we gave to the United Way, our entire college, we gave $4,000 to United Way effort in October. This year, last year we gave over $40,000. This year our goal is $42,000. We're making a, we have to make an impact throughout our entire community and we have to be a part of everything as a community college if we're going to be successful. And I'll throw one more thing in. <laughs> one month ago, th this, you, you, can, you can call this what you want, and, and, and uh, there, there, there's been one book that's written about a lot of this, but you can call it what you want. Last month, our economic development people granted us $8 million for our efforts, $8 million. That's a successful relationship. <laughs> But, but Lynn or Sheila, do you want to comment on the, the sort of looking at the system or your, your relationships with the, ec the traditional economic development professionals? Right. I think when we started um, the Employer Resource Network um, four years ago, we decided to start with the private sector first and build that um, relationship um, with them along with the Pennies from Heaven Foundation and United Way of Mason County because we thought we could move quicker, faster, and then that the nonprofit sector could come alongside of us. And so now today what we have is that we have the nonprofit sector and the private sector willing to all come to the table together. But when we had that first original meeting, we were not able to, to do that. We had to kind of keep people segregated a little bit. But now because of building these relationships and these partnerships, we're able to, um, you know, the nonprofit sector and the, the private business community are able to work side by side. And we also have a very strong um, working relationship with our economic development um, executive director. So, um, and we, um, we partner together on a lot of different projects within our own communities. I think the thing that's been most helpful to us is the, the structure of our own board of directors. Because I'm a seven county um, agency, our board of directors are appointed by our local county commissioners. That's not usually the way nonprofits get their board members. For me, there are some times that I wish it wasn't the way I get mine, but mostly <laughs> it is really, really good because it gives me one link closer to how county government runs in each of my counties. And I, I most often always have a public health director, a department of social services director, uh, a county manager, an insurance agent, or somebody from the Chamber of Commerce. And that keeps us into that diversified view of how can child care support our community instead of just how can we get a new playground. And, and it's a, a, a different perspective from the board level. It, it, it keeps me focused in the right direction. And that's been one of the strategies that, that we've done that's been very good in our community. Okay, I have another question. I have a few more questions here, but those of you in the room, feel free to raise your hand, otherwise I don't know. Um, someone must know you, Lynn, because they said, <laughs> ask Lynn about the evolution to school-based success coaches. Oh. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> so that's a whole other segment in of itself. So as I said that we um, put a success coach in 12 of our member companies, and then two years ago, we created a community schools model where we have a Department of Health and Human Services worker in the schools, in all three of our school districts in our community. But then we added a community school coordinator, which operates very much like um, the success coach in the companies in um, helping um, children and families to remove barriers that would prevent them from being successful in school. And then we added on to that because we don't have any sliding fee scale for mental health services or behavioral health services in our community. 
So we added, we formed a partnership with our local community mental health and added a part-time um, site team clinician at each of the, or uh, site team clinicians at each of the school districts. And so that community school coordinators work with children and families on helping them to remove barriers um, that could prevent them from being successful at school, whether that's connecting them on site to the Department of Health and Human Services um, um, worker at the school, or connecting them to um, the behavioral health counselor that's on site at the school. And just kind of like a really neat story that kind of shows you how the employer resource network in community schools works together, because we all work together as a team, is that our success coach had a, a, a single mom that had just moved to our community and she had a daughter that was in junior high. And she, the daughter before moving was a straight A student, very outgoing. After moving, she started to isolate and she started like failing classes. And so the mom didn't know what to do, so she went to the success coach at her company and said, what do I do? What are some services that I can get? Nicole, our success coach at that company, called the community schools coordinator and said, hey, I have this situation. And so the community schools coordinator assessed the, the child in, and the mom, referred him to our on-site mental health clinician right at school. So what happened as a result of that? Mom was able to con continue to work and know that her daughter was receiving the services that she need. She didn't have to leave work to try to get her daughter from point A to point B in counseling session. Her daughter was able to stay in school and receive the needed behavioral health services that she need and not miss any school. And so that's really how we look at bridging that whole thing together. Right? It's not about just employment, it's not about just a good education, but how do we connect the dots to create real success in our community? Another question in the room? I think we have a good closing question here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose it, which was, as a leader in a rural community, and I'm gonna say, Beth, I think you should, you should answer this too, okay? <laughs> as a leader in a rural community, what do you wish more urban residents knew or understood about your place? Anyone can go first. I think in a rural community, our biggest advantage is that we're small. We don't have all of the service providers. We probably have less politics. And we know each other, you know? So we can all get to the table um, really easy. And which is much more difficult in an urban, um, urban community. So I think it's easier for us, and I think since we also lack for, um, resources because we don't have the capacity to have a residential treatment center for substance use, um, that we can get more creative in our approaches and that we can all come to the table together to solve our community's most critical issues and try to think outside the box a little bit rather than within our four walls and I do think that that can be more of a challenge in an urban area. I would say that uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you a very good answer to that question because I don't allow myself to think that way. And I hope, I hope that they would think really happy thoughts about us and would love us and care about us, but I, but I will stop there. Uh, we, but we have to do our own, we have to come up with solutions to our, our situations. Uh, I, I want to give Josh Weiner a, 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 a shout out who's in the room now and with his work with the Aspen Prize and uh, his team. They, they are doing some really, really good work and supporting community colleges and allowing us, well, encouraging us to do things that we have never done, challenging us to do those things, and then giving um, more radical folks like me more space to do those things. And I give them a whole lot of credit. And I've been telling John, I know he's embarrassed to hear me say it, but I've been telling him that for a long time. We pursue the Aspen Prize. Our goal is to be the best community college in the nation. And we don't make any apologies about that. And that is good for our community. That is good, large, small, whatever. They support all of them and they support all of us, that is good for us. Let me, let me share one thing about something we're doing and why I don't get into the rural versus urban and all the, those battles. We, we have our own alligators and our own problems that we can fix. One barrier that we had in place was we, would st we, we were open for business for students to come into our place from Monday through Thursday from 7.30 a.m. until four, and on Friday from 7.30 until one. 
that was it. Ten years ago, remember, you've heard about the ten verses now. Ten years ago, if you were going to come seek our services, if you were going to take a class, if you were, in one of the, if you were the working poor, think if I, about it for a moment. Did, did, you, did you really have access? Now, we put in a center. We, we, we paid our city to put in a traffic light on one of our major, uh, major thoroughfares where if you make it to that light, you turn left or right, you know exactly where to go. We created a front door for our college. You know where to go. Once you get in that door, we'll take you to wherever you need to be. That's one thing. The second thing about that is that we will, we, we, we will help you. We will, we will create, we've created situations where we will assist you, register you for what you need, and offer you the support. We're open from 8 until 7 o'clock every day, Monday through Friday, and then we're also open on Saturdays for you. So we, and then if you need something outside of that, tell us. We've extended our LRC hours uh, and we've, we've changed the whole place. It looks more like Barnes and Nobles than it does a traditional library. And we have a coffee shop and all kinds of other stuff there. It's open from 8 until 11, but those hours are pending because students can vote with their feet. If you need us to leave it open until 12, midnight, or, or more, let us know. That's where we are. What can we do about things so we don't, I don't have the, the, the battle large versus small and all of that. It's what can we do with what we have control over to make our community, our college, our, our students better. I was just, oh, that. <laughs> sorry. That's a difficult question. I, I think the heart of the question for me is it is all about relationships. And sometimes what happens in a rural community is there are fewer of us. So we tend to serve on more boards, and sometimes the relationships get complicated because they bleed into each other. So I think it takes sometimes a keener awareness of, I can't do this or I should do this. The other thing that I found out in over the years, because I work very closely with my urban counterparts in North Carolina, is that our ending goal for young children and North Carolina's early childhood education system is the same. But the strategies for how we get there vary greatly. And mostly it has to do with the resources that we have available and how we, how we use those resources. But when your goals, when your ending goal matches, then you can get along with those people. It's just that the strategies will be a bit different. I would actually echo what you just said and also what Lynn said, um, that rural places can be a really good um, place to experiment with new things because the scale makes things more manageable and, and different things can be tested. And exactly what you just said, that, that some of the 30,000 foot level challenges are really the same across rural and urban America, but the implementation, the strategies, the way that things are approached have to be different. And from a policy perspective, I think understanding the context in different communities. I've worked in a number of communities on different research projects, and one thing that's really clear to me is that top-down solutions don't always get good reception and aren't always going to work because of the local characteristics. But things that empower the communities to work together, to work with the residents, and to think about leveraging the strengths. A lot of people talked about meeting individuals where they are, but also the importance of meeting communities where they are. Well, with that, I want to thank you all. I want to thank, I want to thank Beth. I want to thank Danielle, Greg, Sheila, and Lynn, and all of you for coming today, both in the room and live stream. Uh, I always like to end by saying we know that a healthy and prosperous America requires a healthy and prospering rural America. But that won't happen without a close attention to the innovation that's happening in rural and how it can be better supported and accelerated. So please stay tuned for our next America's Rural Opportunity Dialogue, which will focus on innovations related to opportunity youth. Um, and we're, we're waiting to get the right date and, and set of people that work. But in the meantime, go out and enjoy the glories of autumn and invest in rural America. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So now we're working with Lolita a little bit too.